All right, so uh, to remind ourselves where we're at, I've loaded the index file and I'm gonna run this. Take a quick look at it in the web browser to remind me where we're at with it. And then we'll continue. So already, based on where we ended up last time, the big idea is coming together, which is that there was a plain old project which now has a background, the galaxy. We've separated the main content away from the galaxy. That's, um, that's that div. But we still have a lot to do regarding the header, the main content area, the footer. And all of that is happening via the CSS. So the HTML is only about 91 lines, and the CSS will be like 300. So um, we've got body set up, and we've got wrapper. We ended up with wrapper last time. This is a class. You can make yourself a note. Classes have the dot in front. And this will become this will become obvious and second nature soon enough, but just as the note, this is a class selector. Any element that has that dot will be affected by this class. Classes can be used many times per document. And then just for completeness, if we back up at the very beginning, uh, true or false, the first selector here is a class. False. Uh, body is not a class. It is a type selector. Type selector. Targets all HTML tags of that type. There's really only one body in an HTML document, so it's pretty unique. But obviously, if we have an H1, which we can use many times, or an H2 or a P, it applies to all copies of it. Yes? The minus, yeah. Yeah, so this is a cool uh, aspect of Notepad++ when you've got a really long amount of code and you're trying to focus on something. You can click on this code collapsing icon, the minus sign next to an element, and it'll close it up so that you can focus on certain parts of the code. That's very useful in CSS and uh, JavaScript to, to focus. Okay, so um, let's see, we've got wrapper class with margin, border, background color. All of that pretty much is straightforward. What's the width of the wrapper? Um, it's got a background color of white and uh, margin. You can make a note on margin. First value. 1m, one unit of measurement, 1m at top and bottom. Then equal auto space left and right. So the simple uh, definition of 1M and auto, it's a very common thing to do to center your content on the screen. There's many ways to do the same thing. And as I graded the, uh, the work over the weekend, uh, a few people used CSS, uh, and we hadn't talked about it, but adding a margin of 1M auto is one way to center your content. Because the second item here, auto, 
automatic amount of space on the left and the right of the element, whatever the web browser size is. Now eventually this project, when I showed the example, it's, it's mobile friendly, meaning that it'll look nice on a nice big screen, it'll look nice on a small screen like a mobile device. So that means somehow later we will figure out how to grow and shrink the size of this wrapper so that it looks good on a big screen and a small screen. But that will be later. Background color, we've got a solid white color. Does anyone remember how to make a slightly transparent version of a color? So instead of... Uh, what's that? Slight dim. Sorry, one more time. Slight dim. A dim, yeah, but the exact code what, over here, Shelly, I think I heard someone else say. We want to fade it out a little bit with RG alpha, exactly, RGBA. So red, green, blue, and alpha. So if we want to make white, that would be 255, comma, 255, comma, 255, and then 0 0.5. So the first three are the red, green, and the blue. When you add the maximum value of red, green, and blue, 255, you get white. So red light plus green light plus blue light maximum is white light. And then 0 0.5, uh, you know, 50% transparent. So that gives a, that gives a transparent background. So we won't do that with the wrapper, but we will do that with other elements. So you can see through the white div with some alpha. I'm going to leave it plain white, but you can make your uh, you can you can do this. You can copy that same code but comment it and just leave it plain white okay next uh, we're going to define or redefine the header We're targeting any elements that have the header tag. No class. We're going directly to select or target the header. Let's give this a height of 5m. M are the units based on the font. I, I'm not sure if I specified it previously, but we'll mention it explicitly. M units are based on the letter M of the current font. So if you've got a font with a very wide M, the letter M, a 5M height is different compared to a font that has a narrow letter M. Next line, we'll say background. Now, previously, we've written background dash color. We have other properties that target the background. Or we have the sort of quick background property. We could enclose the color of the background um, simply by mentioning it that way. So if we were just to write red, background red, like that, you'd get a red background. 
So we could do background dash color to focus on the background color, or we could do background as a sort of sort of shorthand. The trade-off here is that we can write a pretty complex background, for example, with a URL. We could put a background image. We're going to put a background image in the background instead of a plain white color. I've got an image online. So in quotes, we're going to connect to this image. This is one of the images that was available in in my links. If you want to use a different image, that's fine. So we've got Squirrel Girl, Venom, uh, Jean Grey, Black Cat, etc. All of those uh, characters are in are in the folder in a text file. So we put a background color. I mean a background image. I want to make this really interesting. Uh, first of all, I'm not really seeing the character. Uh, I need to move the background. I need to move the background around, just like we had with the galaxy. Okay, we had a background color, then a background image, a background attachment, and then a background position. This is what I'm saying about if we simply write background we can consolidate all of those into one command, just background. So we're right now we're setting sort of background image. I also want to set the attachment and the position. I can do that by adding a space before the end of that semicolon and say repeat. We had background attachment fixed, background attachment repeat but I'm able to access that by writing it in this format. Then I'm going to say 0 space negative 1 nine zero px. So I'm moving the picture over to the 0 point on x, and then I'm moving the picture up 190 pixels. focus on part of the picture. The picture repeats. It's moved to 0x and negative 190y. Well, this is the problem with choosing a picture as a background that now your text is going to get lost on top of it. So we're going to fade the picture out a little bit. Uh, when, uh, when a few of you added a background picture to your project one, this is the problem that happened. The background picture was really nice, but your text was then hard to see. So if you fade out the background picture, it loses focus and your picture and your text stays more visible. The tricky thing is when you want to fade out a background image, we had RGBA for a color. We can fade that easily. We also have opacity to fade out an element, but it doesn't quite work how we want in this case. So we're going to do a, an interesting complex thing. We're going to put two pictures on top of each other. The Squirrel Girl picture, and then on top a picture, and that one's going to fade out the Squirrel Girl picture. So all of this code here so far affects the Squirrel Girl picture. Let's back up before that picture. We'll put another picture on top of it. But let's put a comma space. We're saying here, let's put some background first and then the other background. And the first background will be faded out to give the impression like the background picture is transparent. Linear dash gradient.
we're going to make a color fade, a gradient. A gradient, if you've taken any graphics classes, is one color that blends into another color in a line. Now, I'm going to press uh, Enter to break this URL into the next line, because it's going to be a long line. And so I'm going to break it into two lines, just so that it's a little more readable for you. Put a color comma on top of a picture in the background of the header. And so we can make gradients in CSS, which is this, but it's kind of complex. So we have to say to space top. This gradient is going to go to the top, comma. Oh, comma after the to top. We're going to select a color, RGBA, a color that can have transparency. It's going to be a simple white color, so 255, comma 255, comma 255, and then for the alpha, we will go with a 0 0.75. space inside of the parentheses for the linear gradient. So the direction, comma, the color, space, 0%. This is another way of saying the transparency of the color. Then a comma, then enter. And then another color, RGBA. The same color, white, 255, 255, 255, 075. And then space 100%. So this is a really complex and interesting way to put a background image but then on top of it, put a faded color. And it's going to be a color that goes from zero visibility to 100% visibility. Overall, still the color is 75% visible. And then all of that. Is to do this. So before that extra bit of color, after. The image is still there, the image is faded out, and now I can start to see the text on top of it. So this bit of complexity is a way to do that. If I want it more transparent, I can change these two values here, 75% visible, 75% visible. If you change that down to 25%, that background is even more invisible. Or maybe it's backwards. Hold on, I have to double check. Uh, yeah, it's backwards. The higher the number, the more transparent, because we're dealing with a color that is visible on top of another element, so it's backwards, actually. So 95, it's very, very, very transparent. We're making this color more visible to fade out that background. It's kind of backwards. making a note really cool complex way to add a background image and fade it out so the thing about any programming language is once you figure out how something works you can then just reuse that idea over and over so in the future, for your own project, this will be a very good way for you to put background images and so that they're not fully visible, so that they don't distract. Any questions on that? All right, let's uh, triple check your spelling right here, and let's...
crazy family in life. Yeah, literally one wrong character and it doesn't load up. So imagine when this is in JavaScript and much more complex. Now this is my this might be one of the most complex things you do in CSS. So if it works right for you now, then it'll work well in the future. So Victor, can you just explain again um, what we did there? Yeah, so what's happening is we're targeting the header. We're setting a background. This whole top chunk right here is putting a color, a white color, on top of, so comma, on top of a picture. So all of this is just to define a color. Technically, we could be like this. All of this could be red. So a red color on top of the image. But doing it really complexly, we've got a color that fades from 0 to 100% visible. Um, but then these colors are also faded out a little bit. So a color on top of a picture, but we faded it out so that we can see through the color to see a lighter version of the picture. So what if you had black instead If you want black, you change all of these to 0. Let's see how that looks. It's going to give it a different sort of character because depending on the color, the image will look like that. So that looks kind of cool. Then you can have a different kind of color on top of that. Yes? So I was curious. You have it on there twice. Mm -hmm. you just put like white and then change the alpha? Would it have the same effect? Or can you put RGBA two times? So you put it from 75 or 0 to 100. It would make sense to put the color one time and just fade it out. But the problem is, again, this trick of fading out a background image, we have to accomplish it by putting in a color. And from what the book has, uh, that's the best way that they've got to do it in the book. We can, we can give it a try. This is the great thing that we can always try it and see what happens. But I think simply by putting that faded out color, I don't think it'll work right away like that. I think it needs, a, I, see then it kind of ignores it. It does need to be in a more complex way to do that. So I'm going to put this back to the faded white color. If you like the faded black color, that looks fine too. And you can put any color. So, you know, if I put zeros here, this will be some other kind of color. Let's see what that looks like. So you got a blue, teal kind of color. <coughs> So you can play with those colors to choose your own, but I'm going with white just to have the color, the image faded out. So this CSS that we wrote here is targeting the header, and we've got a brand new header at the top here. We still need to do a lot with it. Uh, there's this empty space up here that I'd like to get rid of. This is when we get into the issues that CSS is complex, more complex than HTML, because there are elements next to elements, and each element has a default design, a default width and height, and a default color and such that we, via CSS, have to, have to target and alter. So there's something that has a default amount of space that we need to nullify at some point. Notice also, we said that the height of this header is 5M, but that's not tall enough to include all the elements. These home and heroes and such are jumping out. But that's other things we will, we will deal with. So the first thing I want to start to work with is this top text over here. The text, I think, itself is too close to the top edge of the graphic. So I want to target that top text to move it a little bit and deal with other sorts of elements there. So next line, we will say header, space, h1, curly braces. This is going to be something we do so many times now. This is the specificity of CSS. Remember we mentioned if two rules target the same thing, which one wins? The ones that's more specific. This is specificity. Now we're saying anywhere 
think about reading this right to left. Anywhere where there's an H1 that's inside of a header, basically that's what that's saying. Try to read it from right to left. That works for me, because on the right side is the most specific thing that we're targeting. To the left is a less specific thing. Technically, we could write this as dot wrapper space header space h1. So look for an h1 inside of a header inside of a wrapper. But we'll just keep it like this for the moment. So saying from right to left, target or select any h1 inside of any header. And these are tags, so they don't have a dot, they don't have a pound sign, they're not classes or IDs, they're tags. Width of 100%, height of 1.5m, margin of 0. So before those changes, after those changes, I've nullified that space that was bothering me up there a moment ago by setting margins to zero on all four sides. So sometimes via CSS, we have to add some property to how we want it. And sometimes we have to nullify a property that already exists. There is some amount of margin that existed before, by default. So I had to set margin 0, take away that space. How do we, um, and I guess it's just comes with practice, how do we know that that is 0, that the margin needs to be 0, or like the height needs to be one point five. Some of these things we figure out what works by trial and error. This particular height of 1.5 works for the particular font. If I had a bigger or smaller font, I might need a higher, bigger, or, or, or smaller height. So that's a little trial and error. As, the one, as for the zero, always think about it in terms of there is something automatically there. I need to take it away, margin zero. So there was some amount of space up here. I want it gone, margin zero. So that's where the, the thing, everything comes in a little box. Each one of the elements comes in a little box. Right? Exactly, there was a box around this element, around this element, that element, there's boxes around everything. So right now I'm saying for the heading one inside of the header, nullify the margin to zero. I think the text, I've moved up the, the background image, but now the text is still too close to the top. So we have padding top 1M. So we'll back up for a note here. Margins are the spaces outside of the box. Paddings are the spaces inside the box. So we have a way to affect things both padding and margin. Think about it in this terms like this. Um, so this sheet of paper right here, uh, if I have it right next to my podium here, this is a margin of zero. 
this element is right next to another element, margin zero. If I move this piece of paper further away from my podium, I'm increasing the margin. Margin one, margin five. So the space outside of this box is out here. Margin zero, it's right up against another element, margin five. Padding is the space inside of the box. Right now I have a one inch space on the inside of my paper. If I increase this, I'm increasing my margin, I'm increasing my padding inside the element. If I decrease it, it goes closer to the edge. So in Microsoft Word, you can set the space around the edge. Now they call it margin, so it's a little bit different than CSS, but in Word, I want a one inch margin, I want a one and a half inch margin, or padding. I want one inch padding, one and a half inch padding inside the paper. That's CSS. Outside the paper is the margin. Yes? So the padding is kind of like how much space the element is occupying, and the margin is like where is it located according to the border? Mm, I wouldn't quite think about it that way. It's still it both like, of them. Yeah. Is it like the, the space between like the text and the box? It's a little closer to that. The space of the text inside the box. Always think about it inside and outside. Like the padding around the text. The padding is around the, the text of the inside of the element. So think about it more of inside and outside elements rather than position. Think about it like in this building. Right now, this room, 223, is next to 224. There is some amount of space between the wall. That's margin. This room is one foot away from the other room, the margin. But then, on the inside of the room, look at how far out this sticks out. This is the padding. You know, this is a foot inside the room padding. The wall is one foot thick. That's the margin. One foot of space between this element and the other element across the room, between the wall, margin. And then inside, you know, I can't go through this. That's padding on the inside of the room. So again, with many of these things, they'll make more sense as we, as we do them, but here's one way to help you make you make sense. If you play with these values, padding, right now I've got one top. If I change that you know, to 0 0.25, you will see that it moves closer to the top edge. Right now I'm saying let's target only the top edge inside this element. So I move closer to the top edge. It's only 0 0.25 units away. If I increase this up to 2.25, it moves it further from the top edge on the inside. Contrasting that with margin, if, um, if, I, if I put that to 2m margin, for the moment, it's only affecting the top, and again, the complexity of CSS, but just for the moment, it's affecting the top. So I've moved this element two units away from another element to M, outside of the box. So outside and inside of a box. Outside is margin, inside is padding. Remember to also double check the book. They'll, they'll give their own definition as well of what's margin, what's padding. You can always go to the index, look up the property margin and padding, and see a different explanation from the book. Next we'll do color. We've got a color of orange-red. Font dash family. So color is set to is set in a text color. Anywhere where there's an H1 inside of a header, let's set it to orange red. We can mix any color we want, but I've got some colors already picked that look nice. Next I want to change the, the font. So there's a whole chapter on fonts in the book. But basically, font-family will allow us to change the style of the text. 
the style of the text is dependent on what fonts are installed on the person's computer. A little bit later, we will look at Google Fonts in order for us to access thousands of fonts online. So this, is, this assumes the person has this font on their computer. For the moment, we'll set this up very easy. We'll set Helvetica, comma, Arial, comma, Sans Serif. So I had previously a serif font, a Times New Roman font, and now I've got a sans serif or an Arial font. And by me specifying three types of fonts, I'm saying, if your computer has Helvetica, show it, comma. If your computer doesn't, show Arial. If your computer doesn't have Arial, comma, just pick any sans serif font on your computer. Question. Okay, uh, just one moment. So here, the font, first choice, second choice, third choice. And third choice is the most basic choice that the person has on their computer. Two more things, then I'll be right there, Daniel. So text-shadow. I want to add also a drop shadow here. I don't believe we've talked about this one. We've added box shadow, I think, for a fun drop shadow. But we want when we want to specify shadows for text, it's text shadow. Two pixels move to the right, two pixels move down, and a simple black color. And then text dash align center. Centering the text in the element drop shadow, and there's our header.
All right, so the last things that we did right there, some drop shadow to the text and then centering the text. This is more complexity. We did, I, I had said earlier over here, having um, somewhere of auto would center things uh, up here. Wrapper, margin, 1M auto. So go going back now with a little bit more of our knowledge of margin, margin is the space outside. Wrapper is the div that is holding everything. And we're saying, OK, it's margin, it's space outside. At the top and bottom, 1M. That's how we have then some space at the top and the bottom. And then auto, the second value, so some amount of space to the left and to the right should keep it centered. Well, I've also got, we've, we've used now text align center. And by the sound of it, its purpose is to align text. And that's exactly what it did, text align. So now the Marvel Comics text should align itself to the center of its parent element, the heading one inside of header. So we centered the text. The whole thing is centered. And this code here is targeting that top. And it's always going to be centered no matter what the size of the yeah. Exactly. So if I increase the size of my screen that way or, you know, further like that, it's going to stay centered. All right. So next we're going to say nav Let's target any tags where we've used the nav HTML code. For the moment, just uh, follow along with this one, clear both. I'll come back to that one. It's a little more complex to talk about, so we'll say TBA. We'll get back to that one, what it actually means. Setting a height of 2M, background color, steel blue, text color, white. Text align center. So I'm targeting elements that are inside of the nav tag. The height of that element, 2M, so two units of the font. The background color, a blue. The color of the text, a white. And align that text to the center. So the text is centered inside of that nav. This text, I thought I wrote blue, I did, or, or white. I did, it's right there. The dot is white. But this is text that is also a link. So we have to target the color of links. We'll do that in a moment. And um, we're starting to build a horizontal area for the nav. Now I want the same thing in the footer. Down on the footer, I've got a copyright notice. I want that with the same background color, with the same text color, with the same alignment. So what we can do is define a CSS selector, the values, the declaration, and apply it to more than one at once. Nav, comma, footer. Here's our declaration. Let's do all of this. Let's do it to the footer and the nav. So apply the same declaration. So everything in the curly brace to two selectors.
So this can be actually not just two in this case, but 20 if we want it. Um, sometimes you can apply the same styles to multiple elements. And here I've done it to both the nav and the footer. So now down on the footer, the text should be centered, white, background color, steel blue, just like the top nav. This is the great thing about CSS. Once you figure out how to do it, you can apply it to multiple elements. They will all look nice and consistent. The bad part about CSS is figuring out what do I need to write, what's the value, why doesn't it work. Now, um, something we haven't been doing so far, and this is completely optional, but again, this is for aesthetics. This is something that you could do. You don't have to, but if you tab all of these over so that they have a nice alignment like that, that does not affect or should not affect your code. But if you do this on a regular basis for this chunk of code over here and subsequent chunks, I think that looks nice. That is completely personal preference to do that. I like to do that, although it's extra effort that's sort of a waste. But you know, what is art except for a waste of time <laughs> of human expression? So nice looking code is good code. It works the same as before, but I like how that looks. I'm not going to ask you to do that, and it's not going to affect your grade, but in my own personal code, and a lot of coders that I see, they do this. They line up all of these things like that so that you can read it. It does have a value a bit for readability. If it's back to the way it was, you know, it's slightly less readable, but if it's all lined up like that, more readable. Let's start to target that nav bar, those elements right there. Those have been centered, but I want them to behave like a horizontal nav bar. How, how is this element being made again? What are, what are bullet points? Lists. It's a list. So we need to target the code that affects that list. We'll say nav unordered list nav space ul so reading from right to left anywhere where there is an unordered list inside of a nav declare the following make sure there's a space between nav and ul margin 0, padding 0.25m, space 0. I've changed up the spacing a little bit. No extra margin on the outside of the color. So this got closer up here. Inside the color, top and bottom, one 0.25, so the top here, bottom here, although the bottom is not behaving yet, there's 125, 0.25 there, and then left and right, 0. No extra space to the left and the right. So I'm kind of tightening up the space a little bit. This is the question, well, uh, how do I know how much to do that? How much value to put here? This is the, the trial and error a little bit. Maybe I go in here and I actually needed 0.45 based on my font, based on what's around it. This is basically coming from the book. But we're always free to experiment with this. 0, 4, 5 is too much. I don't like how that looks. Or maybe I do like how that looks. 0, 0.25 look good. Next. nav ul li any list items inside of a nav no any list items inside of an unordered list inside of a nav specificity because this could work 
if I simply said ul space li any list items inside of an unordered list but I may have bullet points in different parts of the design and this would be not specific enough this would target too many elements by being specific like this it should only affect certain bullet points display inline So the default of bullet points being on their own line is changed by display inline. The default is bullet points on their own line. Display inline keeps them in one line. So we talked about block level elements, inline level elements. Display block, display inline. Display block keeps them on their own line. They take up their own block. Display inline keeps them all in line, the same line. This is very common to do. Links on a website are bullet points, but then they've been manipulated via CSS to look like that, horizontal. That'd be a good note there. Make bullet points on one line. Via CSS, we can do some fun graphical tricks. Border right, two pixel, space solid, space midnight blue. So we can do a border around all four sides of a box if we just write border. But we can target border right, border top, border bottom, border left, the four sides of the box. So I'm saying on the right side, Let's add a border of two pixels, solid style, color, midnight blue. Thicker border, you just change the first value. You get a thicker line in between. We have solid, dashed, dotted. I think there's one called double. There. So, um, double line, but it's got to be thicker. Keep it simple, two pixel solid. So, now I'm going to have a line that divides each element. But the problem is the line is too close to the text. So, we'll say adding right 1m so now there's a little bit more space so here think about it this list item the home this is one list item we've set its border right aligned and then we've moved it away 1m space that's good so that heroes has a line on the right and a space on the right. Villains has a line on the right and a space on the right. But now we're, we don't have space on the left. We don't see it here because there's nothing to the left. But for heroes, we need space there. And for villains, we need space there. And for about, we need space there. What do you think we do? Padding left, exactly. If we just did padding, we did 1 EM or 1 EM. If we do padding only, that will target all four sides of the box. Remember, we always have top, right, bottom, left. 
So that might give us what we want, and it doesn't hurt to try it, padding 1m, but that will give us padding on all four sides. And now what happens here is that because we've got some space on the right and the left and the top and the bottom, that gets big, which may be a design you want, maybe, but I, I want that, so I, I target it only right and left instead of all four sides. Can't you do like one year and then one year again? Top yeah, you could do it like this. You can do padding <coughs> top and bottom, let's say zero, left and right one. There's many ways, what's the expression? There are many ways to skin the digital cat. So here, this is another way with one property and value, but knowing how to do it, I have no extra space at the top and bottom. And left and right. <laughs> Any one of these ways. I'm going to have both ways here. Obviously, the one in order is the last one that takes over, but I'll just write it as a comment. So this is optional. It's it's deactivated, so it's just for yourself. This is another way to do the same thing. With one line, top and bottom, you have to nullify it. Left and right, or right and left. All right, so that's kind of starting to look cool. It um, looks like a horizontal nav bar, divider lines. When you did this for project one, you wrote the pipe character, right? That pipe character. But that is limited to what the character is via CSS. We can do different colors and thicknesses and styles. Next line, nav ul list item a. That bullet point, those bullet points now are starting to look like a nav bar. Those were bullet points. And those are also links. Link is the a tag. So I'm saying any link, any a tag inside of a list item inside of an unordered list, inside of the nav, target it like the following. And yeah, this is very specific and it's getting more specific. There are shortcuts that we can do. I'll, I'll show that in a moment. But uh, right now I'm targeting all of those links. And I want to do a few things. I want to uh, set the color to white. I don't want that blue link color anymore. I want white, which is now visible or readable text color. And I don't need that underline. You know, underlined links don't look so nice in my nav bar. So we have text dash decoration. None. Text decoration is the fancy way of saying that underline. I no longer want the underline. So we're saying none. And then padding, 0.5m on all four sides. So this is, again, just to space things out a little bit. It looked fine a moment ago. But by adding some padding to each list item, I spread it out a little bit so that it looks like this is an element there. So we have this horizontal element that's starting to look like a nav bar. I want the ability to have an effect when you hover over the 
the links. Next line. Here's where we can do a shortcut. If you can say nav list item A, this is just about the same as this one up here. We don't really need to mention the UL. We don't have to be that specific, actually. We do have to say a list item inside of a nav. So actually, we can take this one back like that. We don't really need it. I put it there to be obvious. A nav bar, inside of it we will have an unordered list, inside of it we will have a list item, inside of it we will have an A tag. To save a little bit of typing, you could you could have left out the UL and that should work the same. See, it works the same. And that's what I'm going to do here. I don't need to be that specific. I'm targeting a link inside of a list item, inside of a nav. What I want to do is uh, target the moment that you hover your mouse over the button. And this one is a very unique syntax. You hardly see it. But A colon hover. No space between the A and the colon. This is a, I believe it's called a pseudo class or a pseudo selector. I'm saying during the moment you hover over an A tag inside of a list item, inside of the nav bar, do the following. Selecting the hover state of the link. So we have different states. One of them is the hover state. We'll, we'll talk about the other ones in a moment. But here I'm targeting the um, background color of that element at the moment I hover. effect like this color is filling into this color. I can't read the text anymore. So we need to set text color. Say gray. tricky in the beginning to figure out. It takes practice. Look what I've done here. I've simplified <coughs> that selector even more. I've just said nav a hover. And it still works. A moment ago it was nav ul li a hover. And that worked too. Sometimes you need to be very specific in your selector. And here I was a little more generic. I can't make it go as generic as simply A, however, because then that will apply to every link everywhere. The link's up on the nav, and we've got a link right here, read more. That's being changed too, although it's a white background on a white background. That's being changed too, and that's too general. Links over here as well. I, I don't want that, I don't want it that general. Any A's? in the nav only target that. And that's the point of the specificity. So now these are ignored. 
these are not changing they shouldn't change read more doesn't change only links in the nav so what I'm trying to do here is these hovers and these look fine, these look nice, it looks like a tab that is popping out, doesn't it? Like a little tab. To make it even more obvious, like a, like a tab, we can round the corners at the top to make it look more like a tab. So we have border dash radius, let's say 5 pixels. If this were a little more obvious, like 15, I don't, I don't quite like that anymore. This kind of looks weird. I want only those top corners rounded, but not this, where it connects. Rounded here, straight here. here. Straight on the bottom, rounded on the top. With a 5 value, you might not have noticed it. But with a 15 value, I notice it too much. That's kind of weird. So. We can target the top corners only and leave those bottom corners alone. Border radius here applied to all four sides. There's a way for us to uh, target only two sides. Border, top, left, radius. Border, top, right, radius. different values there and you get that. Only one of the corners is rounded. So from chapter 10 to 15 or so, it's all about what are the possibilities of what you can do with CSS. And here I'm presenting you again a website with some possibilities of how we can use the CSS. And like I'm showing how you can make it unique. Look at how I rounded that. Very round, less round. Different ways to do the same thing. That one might be fine in what you want. Same values might be another style. Different values, another style. They're all right. You just need to know what the code is and then change it to your, to your purposes. On what line can you point out? What line up here? Um, we'll go back to the rendering. So I have space between the actual hover and the bar itself. Let's see. Yeah, that little bit of extra space that you had at the bottom. Um, maybe I would play with the pen.
padding bottom or margin bottom. Okay, so if I hover over these elements, I get the tab. Isn't it very common that when you visit a website, there is already one element already selected? Right now I'm on the home page, the index. I want it to tell me you're on the home page. Later when we go to the about page, I want the about tab to stay popped up like I'm on the about page. You see that on websites, don't you? So I want to keep activated the home but the, the home hover state. I want to keep home on because we're on the home screen. This will require two things. This code here is what creates the tab, basically. But I need to apply it sort of permanently to one element. So we'll do here when the person hovers, comma, we will apply this also to any nav a tag dot link on well I had a colon a moment ago because that means when I hover over a link here I'm saying any link that has a class of link on make the pop-up the little tab this won't work yet because I haven't applied the class I'm setting it up anywhere where that class exists attached to a link make that white tab so we need to get back to the HTML for a moment I've got the home link on line 16, the A tag, which is inside of the nav. See, looking at it that way, nav element, A element. I want to target that one. I'm saying it should have a class. So A href attribute and then class attribute of link on. Now these two match. We would write them one or the other first. Doesn't matter. If we had written the HTML first, then I at the very beginning last time, and I said, okay, we're going to write this and we're going to add a class here. We're going to use this class later to affect it specifically with CSS. Then eventually we would get to this. We did it backwards. We wrote the CSS first, then we went back to the HTML to say, I want to attach that CSS to this HTML via this class. Now if you run it, you should see that the tab is automatically popped up. It, it looks like it's already active. Because we're saying, apply this style when you hover and on any classes that are A tags in the nav. No space there that would technically give you something else and it doesn't work spaces means from right to left this is inside of this is inside of this spaces no space in this case is that this class is attached to this tag attribute is added to this tag. It's in the angle brackets. This is how we represent it in HTML. This is how we represent it in CSS. This class is attached, no space, to this tag. This A tag is inside of this list item. This A tag is inside of this list item, which is inside of nav, which is inside of nav. Spaces.
So you should have the home tag, home tab, automatically up. We'll do one more little little fun thing. This looks uh, kind of three-dimensional, that this is on top of this. To fully complete the three-dimensionality of it, we'll add a drop shadow as well to separate that tab from the background. So still inside of this CSS rule, we'll add a box shadow. One pixel move to the right, negative one pixel, so one move to the left, one pixel, blur, color, RGBA, black, but a little bit transparent. It's really subtle and you can make it more obvious. Now there's a drop shadow moved uh, to the right a little bit and to the left a little bit. Black. And to make it more obvious, just increase those values. You know, two and two. It's even more three-dimensional. This element is top of that element. But because of that transparency, it's black but transparent. That black color goes and fades to this, through this top color. those values a bit. They don't have to be the same. Here I've got 5, 4, 3. So 5 pixels moved to the right, 4 pixels moved up. And if I was moving it too far up, it was starting to detach from there. More blur, 3, black, and then I'm seeing through the black to different colors behind it. You can choose whatever values you like there, but I'll keep them simple. note up here um, and because we're selecting the hover state and with that comma any links with the link on class do a little bit more and then we'll wrap up for the moment. Let's start to deal with our main area, which is section. And we're going to start to set ourselves up for a left column and a right column. In the HTML, that's set up through having a section and then in a side, left side, right side. So we're going to target everything on the left side first, which is a section which has a class of blog, because we have more than one section. We have a section also inside of an aside. So we will see a little bit later. We're going to write aside space section to target that section. 
But for the moment, we're targeting this main section, which has got a class of blog. So in my case, I'm getting up to just about 100 lines of CSS. So we're about one third of the way through our code. All right, so we'll say section.blog. That's how we target a particular class attached to a particular tag. That's how that looks in HTML, section class attribute blog. That's how it looks in CSS, section dot blog, no space. So now we're targeting that element. And what we'll say here is um, float left. This is basically what it sounds like. We're going to make this whole section float to the left side so that later we can have a right side, right column, some padding so that the elements are not so close to the edge. Five pixels, five pixels, zero and zero. Well, why didn't I just do five px space zero? If I did 5px and 0, that's applying 5 to the top and the bottom, and 0 to the left and to the right. I'm not doing that here. I'm applying to the four sides in the order top, right, bottom, left, clockwise. Top, right, bottom, left. So on the top and the right, 5 pixels. On the bottom and the left, Zero pixels. Why do you use commas versus when you don't use commas? Commas are, are kind of rare. We haven't really used commas that much. Where we've used comma is up here where we're saying let's target a hover, comma, and a class. Uh, like in our font styles, or if we're talking about the colors, like RGBA. Mm -hmm. So we did use commas on font family. That's a special case. One comma and another comma and another. Think of commas really as and. So when we had up here, add a background linear color and then add a um, picture. So commas are and. Um, I wouldn't really think of these as and. Uh, I'm, we're applying padding to all four sides at the same time. It's not in the concept of do it to this and then do it to that. It's just all at once. Border dash right, one pixel solid steel blue. Padding right, one M. And then with 70%. Okay, so now we're defining the maximum size of that section. Left side, right side. If I didn't say with, this block section wanted to take up 100%, even though we said float it to the left, we never then really said, only take up 70% of the space. Once I've added width of 70%, this element here will be 70%, and what's left over will be next to it. Although this is setting up our left column. We've got a line that is a divider there. Steel blue. So that color seems to connect from the top to the bottom because they're the same color, steel blue. There's a little bit of space 
so that your text isn't exactly next to the line that's padding right uh, we've actually said it twice padding then padding right top right bottom left so then I guess actually we could have just set it up here I would have done the same thing I guess not there is a little spot there that you add more space to yeah there's that trial and error by figuring out these values without this one it was too close so then we said we give us some more space another space And then lastly, for the moment, this text, that's an H2. We're going to target it. Section, space, dot H2, top. Now this does have a space. This can be done many ways. Section space h2 dot h2 top. That would work as well. That way is saying a class attached to a heading 2 inside of a section. I skipped adding the h2. Here, technically, I'm saying anywhere where there's a class in a section, apply this because depending how I set this up if this was an H2 and this was an H2 um, or, or that is if this if this was an H2 and this was an H3 and I did H2 here this would only apply to that one and not that one if I want it to, to be consistent here it's saying anywhere with those sections and then an H2 Class. We're going to say um, margin, so a little bit of space outside of the of the of the element. One point five m at the top, space zero at the right, space zero at the bottom, space zero point seven five m at the left. font family times comma quotes times new roman comma space serif so here i'm contrasting it I want I want an aerial on some parts of the design and I want times in another part. And I want to increase that size. Font size 2M. Featured posts text has some space at the top there, and um, at the top 1.5m. If I if I think that's too much, I can change that value. On the right side, it doesn't matter because there's nothing next to it. On the bottom, no space. 
but there's something else that is creating that space. And at the left, 0, 075. 0, 075. I wanted that to line up exactly. I need to play with those values a bit, that final fourth value, further to the right or the left. And then I'm setting the font and I'm setting the size. Here's the project so far. A while ago it looked something like that. Now we're getting columns, top nav bar, rollovers. We're going to work next time, Wednesday, to continue on the main section. Uh, the picture is a little too large. We need to make the picture a little smaller. I want the text, the H group, to the right of the picture as well as that paragraph of read more. So I want to move this, these things here, to the right of this picture. And then I want to apply that to the next picture. Make the picture smaller. It's accompanying text to the right. That'll be CSS. Then we move on to the right column so that I can style this stuff. It's too close to the left edge. I want to make those links nicer. Once that, all, once that is all done, that main design, that was a focus on a desktop version of the project. I then want to make a version that if the person's monitor is smaller, if they're on a mobile device like this, right now the project doesn't fit in their window. Then after the project is done for the desktop, we will work on changing it via CSS for a mobile version, a responsive version. It's going to change and respond to the person's screen. So I'll end the lecture at this point. I'm going to put the code in the folder. We'll do a little lab time if you need some help. When we come back on Wednesday, we'll continue the, uh, the lecture.